Hey everybody, World War Boy here, and welcome to our monthly collection update for the month of January 2022. Alright, so for the month of January, we got a decent amount of items, I suppose, and several good ones in my opinion. I really like everything here. Um, uh, most of the stuff actually came from the Civil War show, which you most likely saw the video. Uh, these three pieces here came from the Civil War show. Uh, these three pieces here came from the Civil War show, and then so did these three uh, little tins over here. Um, and we got a good variety of stuff. Uh, these three pieces are actually from the Civil War. Uh, these three items are World War II German, and everything else is World War II U.S. So I'll probably start out with the things that I did not get at the Civil War show, since I have the least amount of those. Uh, starting off with this piece here, this is a World War II U.S. 37mm anti-aircraft shell, which is dated 1941. You can see there on the head stamp, it's dated 1940, uh, 1941. We can also see the lot number, 8099, and then also 37mm Mark III A2. That's just on the actual shell, of course. The actual projectile does come out. You can also see right there on the copper drive band, 1941. But that's the projectile itself. It's uh, fully complete, other than it's missing the brass uh, fuse um, brass fuse primer there at the top. Next up, we have this um, World War II uh, U.S. theater knife. If you don't know what a theater knife is, a theater knife is uh, just a knife made um, in various theaters of war. Of course, there was the uh, European theater, the Pacific theater, etc. Um, but a theater knife is pretty much just a knife made in one of the um, many theaters, uh, usually made out of uh, you know spare parts or just things lying around, whatever the soldier has available. Um, what's interesting about this one, actually, is that the actual blade of this theater knife is made from a World War II U.S. Uh, Cataragus 22-5Q uh, fighting knife, which has actually been shaved down on the end here. Um, and as you can see on the from the picture on screen, we have the exact same um, brand right there on the blade, the marking. Then the handguard here is just made out of a uh, kind of thin piece of aluminum. The handle is just some stacked pieces of leather, which are unfor unfortunately coming a bit loose. Uh, but then the palm along the end is uh, unknown <laughs> aluminum piece. Uh, but I've always wanted a theater knife, so I'm glad I got this one for a really good deal. Um, they've just always been interesting to me, uh, considering the fact that every one of them is different, and they have their own uniqueness about them. Um, and they were made by a soldier who is most likely uh, deceased at this point. Also, you never really know exactly what uh, the pieces are from, uh, like the leather or the handguard or even the pommel, for example. And then it uh, has a leather sheath, which is in okay condition. Um, you know, it's coming apart in a few places and, you know, starting to tear at some points, but... Other than that, the leather is in really good condition for its age. Um, I'm unaware whether this is handmade or whether this went to some other type of knife, but here on the front, we do have a included sharpening stone. Uh, but I am glad that I got this piece. All right, next up, moving into our pieces that we got at the Civil War show. I got three of these World War II U.S. Uh, anti-dimming cloths for, I believe, either the M3 uh, gas mask or the M3A1 gas mask. I'm not really sure about that. I may be wrong because I couldn't find much uh, information on these. Uh, but you can read there, this can contains one anti- or contains anti-dim cloth for gas mask, instructions for use, wet the fingertips, and moisten the inner surface of of the eyepieces, rub vigorously with the cloth until the surface is clean and dry. When to use the anti-dim cloth, the cloth is to be applied to the eyepieces after each time that the mask has been worn. If the cloth becomes wet, allow it to dry without squeezing. Then we have a lot number, 
and uh, we're back at the other side. Um, but these do, of course, contain the original uh, anti-dim cloth, of course. So these were a really good price, so I went ahead and got three of them. Next up, we're going to be looking at these three pieces. Uh, of course, going to a Civil War show, we couldn't come home without at least one or two uh, Civil War items. So while these may just look like humps of rust, these are all actually uncleaned um, Civil War artillery shrapnel pieces um, from shells, cannonballs, what have you. Um, this one is my favorite piece. You can see here these threads, um, which would have been on the top of the artillery shell where the um, fuse would have screwed into. So this was a good bit, well, a little bit later um, than the wooden fuses that were used prior. Um, so that's one. This is a small piece. And then this one, which is uh, the actual base of a shell. You can see the um, 90 degree angle there, for the base. Um, and while these are rusty now, I will be making a cleaning and preservation video soon on these. Um, where I'll be cleaning them up a good bit and coating them in a sealant to prevent them from rusting anymore. And I'm actually currently talking to a uh, dealer that I met at the Civil War show. And I'm going to get a few more pieces uh, and some really large, uh, very thick pieces too. Um, so I will be making another video afterwards once I get those. Maybe this weekend, hopefully. Um, but I will be making another video of me cleaning those too. And then last but not least, we have our German items here. This is a... World War II German um, M43 cap uh, badge, an Edelweiss. Edelweiss is a German flower. Um, uh, the Germans used Edelweiss pins and badges on um, the M43 field caps for mountain troops and whatnot. So this is a more cheap version. It is original. Um, it's just a different variant. Some of the other ones are a lot better quality made and have holes in several of the corners for you to sew them on, whereas these you would just sew various different points uh, over the actual pin to hold it on. But I am glad I got that. I have wanted an Edelweiss pin for a while, and this was a good price, so I had to get one. Next up, we have uh, definitely one of my favorite pieces. This is a World War II German National Socialist Madschenschaft um, pin. The uh, National Socialist Madschenschaft was created in 1933 along with the National Socialist uh, Frauenschaft. Um, and these pins are basically a Nazi Women's League pin. If we flip it over, you can see the actual pin and the maker's name, Guess Gesch based on the small, small amount of information that I could find about these and what the uh, seller at the Civil War sh show told me. They made these in three sizes, this being the smallest. Um, the guy actually had the largest size for sale, um, and it was only, you know, a little bit more than this one, just about 10 or 15 bucks, but I figured I'd just go ahead and get the small one and save a bit of my money for next time. And last but not least on our list of new additions to our collection for January and our last item from the Civil War show, and probably my favorite piece, uh, we have this World War II German uh, Damon brand flashlight. You can see here, um, upside down, if we flip it upside down on the bottom, you can see there Damon and the actual lens and bulb at the top. These flashlights are really interesting. I've wanted one for a while, and I'm glad that I got this one. If we look on the back, you can see a leather strap, um, which would be used to attach this uh, to your field tunic to keep it um, from, you know, flopping around. Um, and it's adjustable right here. If you flip this up, this little tab, you can adjust the strap. Um, but you can notice these three um, knobs on the front. Most people would see these three uh, knobs on the front and assume that that's the on and off button. But in reality, the on and off button is here on the bottom, which you can turn on and off, of course. Uh, but these three knobs 
What's interesting about these is these actually change the lens color. So you slide them up. So there you have a red lens. The middle one is blue, which is really hard to see on camera and in person, but it is blue. And then the last one is a green lens, which is a bit hard to move, but I am glad they all still move, this being, you know, uh, over 75 years old. Uh, you can still see the original paint colors for the lens uh, colors. There's red, of course, blue and green. And the whole thing itself still has its original um, paint in most places, except for here and then a bit on the top where uh, the other kind of clear lens is. Um, and if we open it up right here, there's a tab used to close and open it. If we open that, you can see the inside. Here's our bulb and uh, aluminum kind of fixture piece for the uh, bulb. And then on the back, we have two storage um, kind of clamps for two extra bulbs. And then this whole space right here is for the battery. Um, of course, it didn't come with an original battery. Even if it did, it probably would not work. Um, like I said, of course, this being over 75 years old. But I did recently um, just the other night I actually order a reproduction replacement bulb for it um which is you know it's brand new so hopefully the flashlight will still work i'll be making a video on that so i'm really really hoping it does um but the only downside is the battery's coming from poland and of course me living in the states that's going to take a good while for it to get here but hopefully not too long hopefully it'll get here soon and i'm already looking forward to making that video but other than that that's pretty much it for this month's collection update. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and hope you enjoyed seeing the new pieces I got. And I'll see you all in the next collection update.